All right, welcome back. Uh, good to be here. Uh, thanks for joining. If you're staying up, I'm going to just say good for you. Uh, if you're behind today, I'm just going to say, well, that's okay. Um, let it go. Get caught up when you can. And uh, otherwise, just try to keep up with wherever you are. Even if you're a day behind, a week behind, just stick with it all the way through. Uh, it'll be a blessing to you. If you're going to do this in a year, awesome. If it takes you two years, it's still awesome. I mean, you're going to get through the whole Bible. So uh, thanks for being here on this journey, and uh, let's go ahead and, and dive in. We are jumping into wisdom literature today. Oh, I'm sorry, poetry. There's different ways to call it. We could call it wisdom literature. Um, I'm, I'm going to change the title, actually. I like calling it wisdom literature. I took this from someone else. Um, so I'm going to call it wisdom. There we go. Um, yeah, like I said, you could call it poetry. Um so we're going to change it to wisdom because I like that better. So here we go. Wisdom literature. And we're going to start with Job. There are some who believe this is potentially the oldest uh, book written. One of the reasons for that is uh, the Hebrew that we have in it. There's some uh, different style wise that seems uh, older uh, in the writing. And so that's one reason. Other Also, uh, just a thought. It's thought that... Um, Job would have been a contemporary of uh, Abraham. And so while we have uh, Melchizedek, who is a priest, um, who comes and worships the true God, it's thought that, that there are others, not of the people of God, but there are others who God does communicate with and who do uh, serve God uh, entirely. And so Job is thought to be another one of those. So all uh, right, let's let's jump in and uh, Job Job is going to get deep at some points, and so I'm just going to warn you as we go forward. Um, but uh, Job is good, good stuff. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Again, if you were with us at the beginning and you read through Psalm 1 and 2, boom, there you go. He was the personification of Psalm 1. All right. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, so that'd be 10,000 oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Now, recently I was looking at a few things around the celebration of Christmas and some things, and one of the things that's Interesting here, and I, I'm going to go look this up because we're right at the beginning of Job, so I need to go. I don't need to. I'm going to go and look that up. So I don't remember it saying they celebrated their birthdays. Their feasts had gone. Uh, feasts in their home. Each one his day. Oh, see, that's what I'm used to. I didn't catch that. It would have been a reference to birthday. Okay, cool. Um, oh, interesting. So, the reason I, I wanted to stop there a minute is one of the things that, that, that it talks about is where we was looking at is, well, why don't we know when Jesus's birthday was? Because uh, Jewish people, um, people from the, the Middle East, uh, historically, they didn't celebrate birthdays. Birthdays was a Greek and a Roman uh, thing. Um, so that's fascinating. I never caught that, that his day, all right, that's just the day he does the feast, not birthday, never made a connection. There. Okay. So, so that'd be one reason we don't know because his birthday wasn't significant, uh, in their minds. That wasn't a, a thing that they celebrated. Uh, however, one of the things with birthday celebrations is let's just think of a birthday celebration as each one celebrated their 21st birthday. All right. I think you got an idea of what might've happened there. Um, so that helps set us up for, uh, what Job is going to do uh, and talk about. So 
his sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of fasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. If you were here yesterday and you read Romans, the connection of cursed God in their heart, a connection to what's inward is what's significant, ooh, that should be ringing in your ears. One day, the angels came to present themselves before God, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? All right, I've got to stop here. I, I know too much of this text to, to let that go, because I understand why they're translating it that way. Um, it's just not a, necessarily a good translation. All right. So now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. Okay, that's that's better, but but still not good. Okay, present themselves and Satan. Okay. Let's look there. Satan, masculine, adversary, uh, one who withstands adversary in general, personal. Okay. Oh, it's not going to give it to me the way I want it. It's just broken it down this way. I would need a Greek translation to show you what I wanted to point out. So here it should read the Satan. Uh, it's not capitalized Satan. It's the Satan. And just like uh, English doesn't allow the Leighton, the Bob, the Mary, the Brandy, uh, those are those are bad English. That would also be bad uh, Hebrew. So it is saying not the Satan. This should be translated the adversary came also among them. And let's see the sons of God. I wonder when the sons of God. Yeah. See here, Ben is son, and it's plural. Um, Elohim. So this is sons of God. This is not necessarily angels. And, and if you want to go dive into this deeper, I don't have time to. Um, there is this idea of a divine council. I mentioned that when we hit Genesis, when it was the plural us. Here's the plural us, the divine council um, that's happening here. And because of our lack of cultural understanding and our thinking that we have to say there are no other gods, there is only God we shy away from English that leads us to think anything other than that. Uh, but um, think of it as a divine counsel, not that rules with God, but that God uses, and there's some places elsewhere, and you can go, uh, Michael Heisner's got a whole thing on this, uh, the supernatural that helps uh, flesh that out. I don't have time to do that in here. Um, but I wanted you to think about that because we, we too quickly think this is Satan himself, the devil, and this is the adversary. It's the one whose job it is. This is their job. He's not being obnoxious. He's not being sadistic in some sense. He's pointing out and doing his job. This is his job. His role is to do this. This is not uh, from, from what we would necessarily think. This is just evil incarnate running him up. No, it's not the adversary. It, it, sorry, it is an adversary, the adversary. Um, that's what he, or the accuser. Um, this is where have you come from? Not that he doesn't know. He's getting specific details, giving him a chance to talk. So the Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. When the Lord said, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? The Satan replied, the accuser replied. I'm going to do that occasionally. I'm not going to do it consistently, but I just want to, because I guess here's part of it. 
even if we read it as as Satan and think of him as as the the devil and the singular uh, being who who we associate that with, it do, it doesn't um, change some of the understanding of the passage, but it reads into uh, it a little bit too much specifically if we do that. I think so. So he's pointing out something that is here for us to learn from. Go back and it and it said he he was worried about in the heart. Here the accuser is is as really pointing out is he serving God from the heart or not? That's what he's doing here. We've already had Job point out that he wants to have his kids motivated from the heart. And so the accuser is saying, I, I see the blessings he gets. Maybe that's the problem or the only reason, not his heart. So it's still the same thing. So we've already had the Job pointed out. The accuser now is enforcing that thought, unbeknownst to Job whatsoever. So does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. This is not just in the heart. This is to the face he's going to do that. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, then. Everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. I mean, if you hit him, huh, you know, let's, let's just test this. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Okay. There's other places when we look through and there's this council that gets together and God says, um, I can't think of where it is, but it's another one that says, how can we go up and tempt him? And someone says, well, I'll do this. I'll put a, a I'll put a, your words in the in the mouth of the of the false prophets or the false words in the false prophets tell him he's going to win in battle and he'll go up so so there's that kind of place where you can go and look at that elsewhere so here's the god getting the idea not that he doesn't have it he invites this in and there's a couple other places in scripture he does that so i just wanted to make that known that this isn't a unique thing so then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a message came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the donkey were grazing nearby, and the Sebians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one that escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I alone am the only one that escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. All right. I'm going to pause because otherwise you're going to keep hearing this beeping, and then I want to get rid of it, so... My phone will keep beeping until I look at it. I wanted to read through those quickly because I wanted you to hear the the boom, 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 more bad, more bad, more bad, more bad. So let's let's just throw some some idea of how bad this could be. So um, you get a phone call that um, your your uh, parents uh, were were in a car crash and they're in the hospital and immediately getting off of the phone you get a call from uh, your grandparents saying that that one of them has cancer and immediately getting off the phone you get a phone call uh, that says uh, that uh, your children uh, were were in a hijacking and they're taken hostage and you immediately get off the phone with that and you get a call uh, from your boss and says you're fired yeah <laughs> No good, very good, no good, very good, bad day, or however that goes, I can never. Horrible, no good, very good, or very bad day. There we go. How do you respond to it? 
This is Job's response. So good here. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground in worship. Completely the opposite response that was expected. What does he say? Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord take it away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Ooh. How, what's his heart? God's awesome. I, I remember fondly all the stuff I had. God's awesome. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. I love that phrase. I will want to come back to that later in all this. Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing because later he gets accused of that. And later commentators think that he, or I shouldn't say comment, later in the book, people will think that maybe he did. And I'm like, no, I didn't, right here, remember this? It's right there, right there, you can see it. On another day, the sons of God, I'm sorry, there I'm going to correct it. The sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and the Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to the accuser, where have you come from? This sounds familiar. The accuser answered from roaming throughout the earth, coming back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to the accuser, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil, and he still maintains his integrity, though you enticed me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin. <laughs> a man will give all he has for his own life, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he'll surely curse you to your face. Yeah, you know, it was a good try, but, you know, mm, he hung it out. Yeah, he, he thinks it's all going to come back to him, but let's go a step further. The Lord said to Satan, very well, then, he is in your hands, but only spares life. Okay, you couldn't strike him before, now you can strike him. You can strike everything else, he didn't fall. So, notice the, the repetition in the sequence there at the beginning, though. The, the, the why were you doing this? The idea. The, they're parallel. There's a parallel between one and two in the connection of the starting of what's happening and what's not happening. And Job is completely unaware of any of this. This is the stuff that's happening in the heavenly realm. And he's living in earth, in the earthly realm, and doesn't know any of it. And yet, the accuser uh, does know what's happening in the earthly realm. He, you notice he does have to go to and fro on the earth. He's not in all places at all times. I want to point that out. So um, so that's true. So now, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted Jew, Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it, and he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? curse God and die. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Should we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Let's see, what was the other one? Um, sin by charging God with wrongdoing and sin in what he said. Okay, still would have been words there both times. I just wanted to, to double check that. But I do want to stop for a second and look at this. I have often heard, um, okay, that the thought here is a only a single thought that Job's wife sinned. Well, I'm not going to argue whether she did or didn't sin in saying, curse God and die. I mean, that, that she's enticing Job to sin. I'm not going to argue that either. But what I've often heard is her motives. I... I question what most people think are her motives. Most people think her motives are evil. Think about this differently for a minute. If you have ever had a family member suffer for years with a chronic illness that continues to get worse and worse and worse, and they finally pass away, what do you think it is? A blessing. Why? 
Well, we know that if they're if they're they're one of God's children, they're now with Him, and the suffering is no more. So we have that hope and that assurance on that side of things. So, do we at times pray as they might that God will take them home to be with Jesus? Yes, I think that that is the mentality that his wife has here. She doesn't. She, she doesn't, she's not going to end Job's life, but she wants to see his suffering come to an end. How is this going to happen in her mind if Job swallows his pride and gets rid of his integrity and curses God, he'll die. You don't curse God and live. So if you do that, your suffering will be over, Job. You're being, whatever her thought is why he's suffering, her thought is how he can end the suffering. And I think she's acting out of love for him and love for him and a desire to see his suffering end is her motivation. Now you can say it's still sinful and I'm fine with that, but I'm saying her motivation is out of love for Job. Whether it's sinful or not is a separate thing. And I'll say maybe it is sinful. And in fact, I might agree it is sinful. Um, the same way I would say that helping someone end their life would, would be sinful. We're now acting and playing God. So this would also be enticing God to do that. Well, we can say that's that would be sinful on that point. But I wanted to point that out. It doesn't give us the motivation. But think about that possibility that her motivation is different than maybe what you've heard before. Well, let's finish Job 2. In, okay, so we read that. So verse 11. When Job's three friends, Ilpaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite, heard about all his troubles that had come upon him. They set out from their houses and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. Notice the goal, sympathy and comfort. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud. They tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. They sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. They wanted to sympathize with him. How did they sympathize with him? By doing the response that he did to begin with. They tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. He tore his robe and shaved his head. A little bit different, but, but sim symbolically the same thing. They joined in the response of outwardly showing the distress they were feeling. And they, they sat with him on the ground in silence. In silence. They sat with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word because they saw how great his suffering was. His suffering was so great that words could not bring comfort. The only thing that could bring comfort was being present in the suffering. I want you to think about that for a minute because Jesus, it's not always his words that we think of that are the comfort. It is the fact that he suffered on the cross that brings us the comfort. It is the fact that he was in agony. So when we are in agony and suffering, it's the fact that they are joined or that he has been there that we find comfort. So it's the fact that his friends are with him that brings comfort, not the words they say. Too often, I have seen people who come into the room and their very presence brings comfort. They hold hands. They give a hug. They sit next down to someone and there's comfort and relief that you can read on the person's face. And then what happens? People are uncomfortable with the silence and they think they need to say something. So they say something and they ruin the comfort that they just brought the person. And you can see their face change and the comfort that they were experiencing diminishes. It goes away. So just think about that. The next time you have someone who's struggling and suffering, if you're able to and when you're able to be with them, don't worry about what to say. In fact, say very little. Just give them a hug. Hold their hand. 
sit next to them, just be with them. They came to bring sympathy and comfort. What was it that brought sympathy and comfort? Their presence, not their words. So I want to end with that. And, uh, well, foreshadowing, they open their mouths and they ruin everything that they did in the first seven days. So we will see that when we come back to this uh, next week. All right. Well, thanks for being here and uh, stay tuned to see just how far they put their foot in their mouth. I'll say it that way. Uh, but anyway, have a great day.